Good morning. Happy Thursday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. And it is perfect, by the way. That's I've, I've been killing it. Whatever I've been doing, the different. No idea what it is, but it is perfect. Paul, did you did you French press this morning? I did. Um, in the forum earlier this week, uh, you mentioned that the stretch shortening cycle is incomplete in regard to tissue behavior. Yes, sir. That's, that would be my opinion. Yes. So I was wondering if you could if you could stretch that out a little bit. Oh, that's funny. Was that a pun? Was that a pun? Seriously? Did everybody hear that? It was, a, sh it was a short talking? answer. Okay. So hang on. So I, I need this date documented because because this would be the second time I think that that I've gotten Manuel to get like a full facial smile, because <laughs> right? he's usually this like you know serious stoic kind of dude. That was good. Um, okay, so when we think about connective tissue behaviors, we have to to look at it um, uh, in, in a much more broad scope, in my opinion, because of the the differences in stiffness, and then certainly the, the way that things are loaded. So all the connective tissues are viscoelastic in nature with different quantities of, of you know, like there's a variety of stuff. So some have a little bit more elastin, some are a little bit more collagenous, and, and then bones have hydroxyapatite to make them a little bit stiffer, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so <clears throat> I always use the, the, the rubber band example um, when we're talking about these things, because it, it's it's useful. So you know the really thick, wide rubber bands in the gym. They're hard to deform, but if you do deform them, there's a lot of force behind it. And then the skinny rubber bands are easy to deform. Um, they move very, it, because they're easy. They move very quickly, um, but they don't produce nearly as much force. And so all you got to do is do like a a banded squat sometime, and you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about, right? And so when we're talking about stretch shortening cycle. Um, what what they have done is they've been a little too focused on certain things and so they'll say well they they imply that muscles are are movers therefore anything that's attached to the muscle and then to the bone they they say oh this is how we produce this elastic kind of a thing and and to a great degree i think they're they're correct but i think it's short-sighted not to include all of the connective tissues um, because of the way that the, the force is distributed through the body. So if we don't address that, and, and I think it would be very difficult. And so again, that's probably one of the reasons why, I mean, it's a little bit easier to look at a, at a tendon behavior than to look at, you know, like the entire distribution of connective tissues, right? To, so to, and, and there are, there are some studies that, that, that do measure the, the, the shape change of bones, which is nice. So it gives us a, a clue there. Um, but, but to say that it's, it's just the, the musculotendinous unit that is producing this force, one, it makes the math wrong. Because if you think about this, if I'm distributing these loads and these forces and the, elasti the elasticity, so, so you know, the, the storage and the release of energy throughout all the tissues, and I don't measure the one that can store and release the most energy, then I'm going to say that, okay, if this was the force production, and then I'm looking at just muscle and tendon as the unit that's producing the force, I'm going to say, wow, this tendon has to absorb and release a whole lot of force, right? When it was like, oh, but what about the skeleton? What about, you know, all the other connective tissues that would be associated with this? What about the, the fluid change that creates the expansion and the compression that is, that is producing this force? So you see how, how it kind of just falls a little short? When you, when, but again, I think it would be very, very difficult to truly measure, um, you know, how that that is distributed. But to not mention it as as being included in this whole process, I think is is where it falls short. By putting a rep count in there, you're actually making it so their strategy is just to get to that rep number. When they're when the strategy might be more appropriately seen as you know they're trying to recapture range of motion or they're trying to feel x y or z and so i have started in circumstances where i'm trying to recapture range of motion just saying like don't worry about the reps for now we'll get to reps like next month um especially with remote clients it's like get we'll get to reps next month but this right now this is all about breathing and like this one or two muscles that you're feeling or the position you're in um 
And so I'm wondering if, I'm wondering how the impact of strategy influences your programming in that way. Like, would you be the, would you be the type of person to, to program reps in a very specific way? Or would it be more like, here is kind of what we're going for in general, because we only want you to be thinking about one thing. Um, and I guess I just want to hear about your thoughts in that regard. Um, it makes people uncomfortable to not have an end. So here, here's what we're going to do, Andrew. <clears throat> we're going to go for a run. And, um, and then we're just going to run until we're finished. Right. Okay. You ready? So here's what I want you to do. You just start running. Okay. And then I'll tell you when you're done. Feels good. Yeah. Right. Okay. So what you're actually saying, I'm, I'm, I, I can totally dig, right? It's not important. Like the repetitions really aren't important, but if I don't give somebody, if I don't give somebody a target, you're, you are now going to affect their ability to perform. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I tell you that we're going to go for a run and I don't tell you how far we're going to go, and I don't tell you how long you're going to run, et cetera, et cetera. You, you immediately have no idea what you need to do. It's like, do I run fast? Do I run slow? Am I running too slow? What pace should I run if we're going to run this far? So if I say, so I don't know if you run, do you run? Um, I mean, sometimes I sprint randomly, but it's not structured. Okay. So if I say that we're going to run five miles today, Andrew, you yeah. immediately have in your head, uh, like whether you recognize it or not, you, you think I have a pace that would be my five mile run pace, right? Like yeah. you wouldn't, you wouldn't run like you're running your sprints, right? You immediately know it's gotta be slower than that because I gotta do it a heck of a lot longer than my hundred meter sprints. Sure. Okay. If you don't give somebody a target and or an end, right? Um, while you might be able to focus on different elements of the of the the process. So if I'm if I'm focused on on restoring movement capabilities and things like that, it's like, yeah, you might get it. But again, it's like, okay, how much effort should I put behind this? Because if if I'm capturing the position, how many times is Andrew going to make me do this? Right? How much effort do I put behind each repetition? And so um, in, in that case, it's always better to give them an idea, right? So um, I don't give a rat's patootie about how many reps, to be honest with you. Um, but what you might want to do is say, okay, we're going to do a 45 second set. And what I want mm -hmm. is I want best quality of repetitions within that time frame. So, because that's all repetitions are, is a, is a representation of duration of exposure and rate of movement, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's what those are. And that provides a, a measure a measure of stimulus, right? So we can dose things a little bit and, and have a little bit more structure. So I think that if you if you leave people hanging too much, it just makes them uncomfortable. But, but like I said, I'm not disagreeing with the premise, but but we have to work with humans that are emotional. And and so um, you know, they they don't like so it, they don't like walking into dark hallways that they're not familiar with, right? So yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you want to increase someone's anxiety when you're trying to recapture movement capabilities? Definitely not. Yeah, that's an, that's interference. That's like interference all day, every day, right? Uh, I had a question. Um, the difference between a tempo uh, deadlift and then a kickstand RDL, where you have the so let's just say the left foot forward and the right foot is back with the toe on the ground. Okay. So would the first one, the kickstand RDL, where the left foot is forward, that would be going from early towards mid, and then the campo deadlift, they'll be going from late towards mid. Would oh, that be the difference because of the pelvis position? I understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, so so we, we, got, we got to talk a little bit about uh, load distribution first. Okay. Mm -hmm. As I unweight one of the extremities. So if I was to pick one foot up, okay, the degree of relative motion changes rather dramatically. So, so let's let's use a single leg RDL as an example. 
So if I pick that foot up, I've just locked the pelvis into one piece under most circumstances, okay? There might be some relative motion, but I'm, I'm talking about within the pelvis itself. Um, so, so we're gonna reduce the amount of relative motion that we have available. So if you're doing a kickstand where the back foot doesn't have as much weight on it, okay? I have immediately restricted the full excursion of that, of that change from, from early to late, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm basically compressing towards the, the middle strategies where I'm gonna be more IR biased, uh, more nutated, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose an element of that. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay. The two foot contact does give me more turning capabilities. So I am able to access, you know, the, the, the two ends, so to speak, okay? But um, I, I just wanted to make that point that, that it would not be my first choice um, to do like a kickstand um, if, I'm, if, if my goal is to increase the excursion. Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, so if I'm doing the kickstand, what, what did you say it was? So I'm left foot forward and then right is back with it on the toes, the, right. the right the toes are touching the ground. Yeah. So, so as you, as you're bending into the kickstand, right, because the foot is behind and I am, I am, I'm more pushed forward on that left side. Okay. Again, we're still playing in this middle ground. That's again, that's where I want you to really recognize this fact. Okay. The degree of turn that I'm going to get towards the loaded extremity is, is less. So I won't be able to push like I won't be able to turn the sacrum towards the loaded extremity as much in regards to the relative motion within the pelvis. Where I'll get the turn is between the femur and the pelvis as a unit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so I'm playing, I'm playing within that middle ground. When I'm doing a campo, because, because of the, um, the two foot contact is gonna be more evenly distributed. It's not evenly distributed, but it's more so than the kickstand. I'm going to get more relative motion within the pelvis and I'll be able to make a better turn where I'll be able to create the, the delay strategy more on the heavier side, right? So there's a load distribution difference in this that's going to prevent the turn. Did I help? Okay. You? Yes. Yes. That makes sense. So if the left foot is in front and you're doing your kickstand deadlift, that will be a little, bit, a little bit more compressive and propulsive. And then Campo, because you're pushing back, you can create more of a yielding strategy on the left you side. You got it, exactly right, exactly right. So you get to decide, it's like, okay, am I biasing this more towards a, a force production kind of a thing? Okay, then I don't want as much relative motion in the pelvis, but I might be able to create more relative motion between the femur and the pelvis, which is also useful at times, right? Okay, yeah. Like where, where do you want the motion to occur? And where do I not want it to occur? Right? One is more restrictive than the other. One's going to allow relative motion within the pelvis. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Thank you.